Come on, there's the mute button unmuting itself. There has to be some flaw in every technical broadcast, otherwise you're not having fun. Uh, good afternoon, good morning everybody. My name is Jesse and I am your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a big new audience today and so if you are joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. A huge welcome to you all as we continue to showcase and celebrate really the coolest people, places, and stories from around the globe. Now today is very exciting too because we are continuing our epic Cross Canada virtual road trip series. We have been to some of the most amazing places, not just in Canada, but really around the world. We're really lucky in this country to have some of the real gems of planet Earth. So if you joined us last week for Wood Frogs at Guwani or about learning how to camp, there are some incredible programs in this series that you can check out on our YouTube channel. Now, before I dive in with today's specific broadcast topic, which is particularly exciting for me, I will note that we do have a Kahoot today. And so between our talk and Q&A portions of the afternoon, uh, if you guys want to dive in with kahoot.it open up a separate tab if you've got your own devices you can do it there use this game pin i will share this again before we get underway but it's a nice extra way to keep it extra interactive and fun today now for today's program we are going to learn about why the snake crossed the road we are going to dive in with one of my favorite groups of animals in the world i know a lot of you might be a little skittish around snakes you're a little fearful of them but there's nothing to fear because they are one of the most amazing kinds of creatures on this planet we are going to learn about some of the amazing work that first canada does to protect them to understand them and to share how wonderful they are with you and wait it sounds like i think we are heading to a news broadcast i'm going to check in for a sec see what's going on everybody oh i'm disappearing myself we're going to Check in with this. Oh, it's our Thousand Islands News Network logo. And it looks like our friends, Anik and Allison, are going to come in to take us away. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Thousand Islands News. I'm Anik. As we welcome you, we'd also like to acknowledge that the lands and waters we at the news station reside and work on are the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people. I'm grateful for their stewardship and care of this place for thousands of years. And that continues to this day. Our first story today comes from reports of a mysterious man near the busy roads right outside our studio with what appears to be a large antenna. We had Madeleine go check it out. Thanks, Anik. I'm here near the 401 highway where we've seen this man in a Parks Canada uniform walking around with what looks like some kind of communication equipment. I'm going to approach him um, and see what he's up to. Hi, we received some reports that you've been walking around some strange equipment. Can I ask you what you're doing? Hi, sure. My name is Matt and I'm a resource management officer with Thousand Islands National Park. Part of my job is looking for uh, wildlife and tracking their movements. Uh, so today, I'm out here to track and find some of my uh, gray rat snake friends uh, with this radio tracking equipment. So as part of this research, I'm tracking five snakes uh, that have transmitters that let me know when I'm getting close to them. Ew, why would you want to track them? Well, gray rat snakes are actually amazing and elegant creatures. So they can measure two and a half meters to eight feet long. This is the longest snake in Canada. And... They are called gentle giants, but I actually call these guys by their names, Bandit, Bruiser, Houdini, but we can get into that later. So uh, Thousand, Island, uh, Thousand Islands National Park is actually the only national park where they occur. So we're trying to find out more information about them to, to better protect them. Could we show people what they look like? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, they sure are really big. Why would you want to learn about their movement and find their home? Why, why is that important? Although gray rat snakes are really big, they are a species at risk. This means if we don't deal with the threats impacting snakes, we'll continue to lose these creatures. And this would have a big impact on uh, our environment here. So wildlife, including the rat snake, unfortunately have seen their habitats uh, fragmented or broken up, which puts them more at risk. Wow, that really gives a lot to think about. Well, since we're on the side of the road here, is that, is that a threat to the snakes? Yeah, roads are something I really worry about for snakes. Uh, when snakes are moving to, to get food, protection from uh, predators, to find mates, they rely on their ecosystem to support them. And roads, unfortunately, cut off uh, that access um, and take away land that they depend on. But even worse, uh, they need to cross dangerous roadways and can be killed in the process. 
Sorry to interrupt. We have some breaking news. I'm getting reports that one of Matt's friends, Bandit, a great rat snake match tracking, has been spotted near the 401. Matt, what are you seeing? Oh no, Bandit, not again. Uh, I'm going to use my equipment now and go find out where Bandit has ended up this time. Could we chat later? Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like I'll have to catch up with the team at Parks Canada and we can find more about the story of Bandit, Bandit and all the other grey rat snakes um, that live like in this area. I'm Maddie reporting from Thousand Islands National Park. Back to you. Welcome back everyone to Thousand Islands News Studio. Thanks, Maddie. It's good to know that there's a dedicated team out there looking for the species at risk like the gray rat snakes. I know many viewers are aware of the dangers many different animals face while trying to cross a road. To follow up on this story, we have Allison from Parks Canada here to speak of the work with the, with the snakes at Thousand Islands National Park. You may remember this earlier story where this man was wandering around with the antenna and other communications equipment. Well, as it turns out, that was Matt, a scientist tracking some snakes to learn more about them. To start off, we need to know, whatever happened to Bandit? Thanks, Anik. Uh, I work closely with Matt on the Rat Snake Project, and I have good news to report. Although Bandit was very close to the busy highway, he was found safe and sound. I actually have some video of Bandit at one of his favorite spots. Could we share it with your viewers? Uh, snakes really do scare me, but let's watch that video. Oh my, what a big snake. That's kind of scary. And the 401 is a busy roadway. In the summer, it transports about 80,000 humans a day. It's definitely not a safe space for a snake. In the future, is there any way you can tell him to just turn around? Unfortunately, snakes aren't always aware of the risks around highways. Uh, remember, Bandit is just a wild animal doing his best to survive. I think he was hungry and was seeking food. And we're only able to receive the data from his radio transmitter. We're not actually able to communicate with him. I can only hope he finds his way safely. But can I ask you a question? You seem to be afraid of snakes. Why is that? Oh, well, I guess I just have always been. They slither on the ground and you wouldn't really hear them coming up to you. Also, I always picture those, you know, with teeth trying to attack me with their venom. I guess that makes sense, but gray rat snakes are not dangerous at all. They're actually quite a calm snake. They're non-venomous, um, but despite their gentle nature, it's still a good idea to give them space, as any cornered animal can become defensive. But I noticed something interesting. When we were out in the field and we were notified that Bandit was headed to the highway, you looked really worried. That's right, I was. I haven't even met Bandit, but... I didn't want him to get hurt. Maybe my fear of snakes is because I don't know enough about them. You know what, Allison? I'd love to hear more about the snakes and, and what you're learning about them. That's great. Um, I'll pass you back over to Matt so he can tell you about his friends, the gray rat snakes. Hello again, everyone. Now I'd like to introduce you to my friends, the gray rat snakes. So. We chose five snakes to track and study, and their names were Bandit, Houdini, Bruiser, Terry, and Jake the Snake. And so you've already met Bandit, the gray rat snake that nearly tried to cross the busy highway, and his name is applicable to his species, as gray rat snakes can actually be considered bird nest bandits, 
as they're known to climb trees and visit bird nests and eat bird eggs as part of their, their diet. Next, we have Bruiser. And Bruiser was named by the veterinarian who helped us prepare the snakes for our study. And he was named Bruiser because he was actually the toughest and the strongest. Uh, but we really all know he's just a softy at heart. Then we have Houdini. Houdini kept trying to escape while at the vet's office and still really remains an escape artist to this day. So although I've been able to get close enough to him to, with the radio telemetry equipment to find his location, uh, Houdini keeps escaping before I can actually get an eye on him. Uh, he's often hiding inside of trees or under rocks, but we know he is close by. Then there's Jake. Jake the snake is the longest and mightiest of our crew. So he is almost two meters long. You really can't miss him. He would be approaching this length. This is a gray rat snake shed. So uh, as tall as me almost. And finally, we have Terry. Terry is our only female snake. And she was the first one we tracked. And we quickly learned that she loves to climb trees like other rat snakes, um, like you can see here. And we often found her high up in trees, um, like you can see in this photo. And you might also be wondering, snakes really climb trees? And yes, grass snakes climb trees all the time. So snakes grip the bark of trees by squeezing their muscles, by bending and flexing their muscles along their long bodies. Um, and by doing that, they're able to climb even without hands or feet. And so you might also be wondering how we know each snake that is that we're tracking. So each one of these snakes was given a radio transmitter by the veterinarian and each transmitter is tuned to a specific frequency. It's kind of like each snake has their own radio station that we can tune into and listen for. And I go out and search their habitats with a couple tools, including a big antenna like this and a receiver that I can put in their frequency. And I walk uh, with this equipment until I can pick up a strong beat. Um, and that is the exciting moment because I know the snake is getting close um, and it's nearby, but my job uh, is not finished until we can pinpoint their location and find out where they are. And this has been super cool to talk about that I do have to go as the transmitters are calling. So. Uh, see you guys later. Thanks, Matt. That was really cool to get to know the snakes. Allison, can you remind me why you're tracking these giant snakes? We are trying to learn about the key habitats of the gray rat snakes and their movement in and near Thousand Islands National Park, where we work. This information will help us come up with a plan to better protect and connect their habitats, to make roads safer, and allow them to live life to the fullest. I guess what might be hard for people to understand is why snakes, shouldn't they be able to protect themselves? These snakes are just out here trying to survive. They may be Canada's longest snake, but they can get hurt too. They face a lot of adversity, both in the natural environment, as well as in areas where humans have added additional pressures. Unfortunately, they have lost a lot of their key habitats in Ontario. We talked earlier about um, roads, and they are a real danger. Also, unfortunately, some humans see them as a threat and try to harm them or eliminate them. Okay, so are these snakes mostly in danger because of us humans and the world we built around us? Humans have put a lot of pressure on them. Snakes are also slow growing creatures. Like other reptiles, such as turtles, snakes don't start having babies until they're quite old. So if we are losing more adults due to things like roads, fewer in the population will be left to have babies, making the population decrease to a point where they are at risk of disappearing. You have asked me so many questions. May I ask you and your viewers a question? Sure. Um, oh. True or false? When a snake sticks out its tongue, they are mad. Hmm. Uh, I've seen this before, and I'd have to say true. They really do look mad. Okay, I'm looking in the chat here too. Someone else says false. 
I don't know. Well, it is false. They are actually just curious. Uh, snakes use their tongues to smell, and by flicking it, they are collecting scent molecules. It's an important way for the snake to understand the world around them. They're not trying to scare you at all. How interesting. But we must get back to the story at hand. You are concerned with some very big problems the gray rat snakes are facing. I'm wondering, how far do you have to travel to find them? Surprisingly pretty far, uh, which is interesting information for us. I really didn't think snakes could travel so far. Um, we are learning about their movement patterns, habitat preferences, and how they find their hibernaculum for the winter. What is a hi hibernaculum? And, and why do you want to know where it is? A hibernaculum is an underground chamber where animals will hibernate. They avoid the cold for almost seven months down there. Sometimes I think I would like a hibernaculum myself to avoid the cold. But since snakes are cold-blooded, they can't generate their own body heat. Hibernating underground in large, group was a, large groups of up to 60 snakes can help protect them from freezing. Understanding where they hibernate is like finding their home. And in the end, that's what we're looking to protect. Hmm. That makes sense, I guess. But how much snake, how much space does a snake really need? Can't they just learn over time to avoid the roads and the houses we live in? Every plant and animal species plays a valuable role in the ecosystem. Everything is connected. Nature depends upon ecological connectivity to support itself. When living things can move through, uh, can move freely, Populations can intermix, helping maintain genetic diversity and healthy populations. With a changing climate, it's becoming increasingly important that wildlife can travel to find the most suitable habitat. Gray rat snakes are just one example of a species at risk that needs to see their habitat connected. Without the natural and undivided space to hunt, hibernate, and breed, we risk, we risk losing them completely. Hmm. I've never really thought about it that way. I'm just thinking of all the things that I need to travel to in order to live. What if somebody put up a dangerous wall in front of the grocery store I love? Oh my gosh, how would I get food? That's right. And for most wildlife, it's even more difficult. So about this ecological connectivity thing, how can you achieve that with human needs for developing roads, building homes and schools and so much more? It's a challenge for sure. Uh, the Thousand Islands are located in the Frontenac Arch, which are stepping stones that create a corridor for movement or migration between the Anirondacks and Algonquin Park. Parks Canada is working with partners along that network to improve the natural connection uh, of environments for uh, between these places for wildlife. You may not know this, but the Thousand Islands is an extremely unique and diverse region where we see many species with different needs living together. Therefore, we need to look beyond the park and, and work together. Hmm. I didn't know I lived in such a unique area. That's pretty amazing. Are there any other animals that you are tracking? Yes. Um, the team I work with, we also have a project where we put tracking collars on deer to learn about their movement. Maybe we can have Matt explain more. Island, one of the many islands protected uh, in Thousand Islands National Park. And this is in the heart of the Algonquin to Adirondack region that Allison previously mentioned with you. And this island is a favorite hangout spot of the white-tailed deer. And although the white-tailed deer is a common species here, not a species at risk like the gray rat snake, it's a species we're tracking to learn more about their movement as well. So to study deer in this area, we've begun a project with Trent University to use GPS collars uh, on the deer to track them. And so GPS collars on the deer collect data using satellites, which send us constant updates. And this study will really allow us to gain valuable information on deer movement across this area and study more the connectivity that these islands uh, provide uh, wildlife moving across the St. Lawrence River. We see some pretty interesting movement from these deer so far. One deer decided it was actually time for a swim. 
and in just a few hours, you cross this busy St. Lawrence River, dodging boats and swimming through fast moving currents and just really to get to the other side. So learning more about deer movements like this uh, may also point to how other mammals are using, using this continentally significant ecological corridor. Other mammals could be big or small. Did you know that the inspiration for the work to connect the Algonquin to Adirondack corridor was actually a 700 pound female moose named Alice? Researchers tracked her over 500 kilometers from the United States, across the St. Lawrence River, over the Highway 401 and into Algonquin Park. Alice demonstrated the need for connected corridors for wildlife, a concept that we're continuing to explore. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Matt. So if I understand correctly, from what you're doing with the gray rat snake study, you're probably hoping to learn more about deer movement patterns and their behaviors also? You got it. Uh, deer are just one example of mammals like Alice the moose traveling through the A to A corridor. Wildlife once occupied all this land and waters and used to move quite freely. We, may have, we have made it more challenging by dividing it up through the development of roads and other infrastructure, which eliminates important ecosystems like wetlands, forests, and others that species depend upon. I, I hope this research will help my animal friends like the gray rat snakes and deer move safely where they need to go. I've learned so much today. Is there anything that I can do to help? There are lots of ways to help. First of all, uh, if you're driving, you can look out for wildlife, including smaller animals that may be harder to see. If Bandit is on the road, he may just blend in. So slow down and be on the lookout. I can do that. And what would be the best way to move a gray, a gray rat snake off the road? I don't want to scare any of our snake friends. Yes, uh, any wildlife you approach will be nervous. They don't know you're trying to help them, right? So make sure you are safe first. Then by simply walking behind the snake, it'll likely move away from you. They don't want to be hurt by you, so they will move. Uh, if you can, try to encourage them to go in the direction they were headed when you first saw them. Hmm. Okay, that sounds easy enough. I promise when in the car, break for snakes. That's great. Uh, another big way to make a difference is to share this information with your friends and family. Get them to challenge their fear of snakes like our friend Bandit. Tell them we want to protect and respect species at risk. And of course, they can break for snakes too. Yes, that's perfect. I'll tell them. I really want to thank you, Allison and Matt, for telling me about the gray rat snakes. I think if I ever encounter one, I'll be filled with excitement rather than fear. And really, I never thought I'd say that. When I first saw your team with your radio telemetry equipment, I really thought you were trying to contact aliens or something. Now I have a whole new understanding about species at risk, ecological connectivity and corridors and how they are the key to helping species live and promote biodiversity. How can I forget the deer and the other animals that go beyond the protected areas like a nat national park and venture further? I really wanna help protect them now. I'm so glad I could be here to share information about my work, um, but I just have one last question for you. Shoot. Why did the snake cross the road? Well, there could be lots of reasons. Um, maybe to find a hibernaculum or to find food, to escape a predator maybe, uh, maybe to fight with another snake, uh, maybe to lay eggs. Um, why, Allison? Tell us why. To get to the other side. Oh, the other side snake. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you all for joining us today at Thousand Islands News. I'm Anik. Have a great day. Oh, I wouldn't have guessed to get to the other side either. So I'm really glad you had trouble with that one as well. Uh, Anik, Allison, this was a marvelous program. We are going to dive in with our Kahoot now. Uh, and so I'm going to give that up on the screen for everyone to check out over the next minute or so. For those who have never joined us for a Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you do win all three of our everlasting respect. And that is worth quite a bit.
Uh, I will note too, while we're having kids pour into the Kahoot, I actually have a Break for Snake sticker on my car from Parks Canada. It's one of my favorite things I ever got. My mom has one too. And I moved to Newfoundland since I did that. So there's actually no snakes here for me to have a reason to have that sticker, but I keep it anyway because it is so spectacular and people can break for all the animals that they find on the road. Uh, 25 in our Kahoot so far. Fast you answer, the more points you get. YouTubers, Try and answer quickly uh, because it is a little bit delayed for you guys. It's about 10 seconds delayed in our Kahoot. We are going to dive in. Anna, Allison, if you want to give us hints when there's a few seconds to go, we'd be more okay. than welcome to take those from you. And I am going to dive in and get us underway. Uh, great questions coming in on YouTube already. Live classes will be coming to you first in just a minute as well. Here we go. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. True or false, the gray rat snake is the longest snake in Canada. Hmm. Hmm. What do we think? Oh, half our answers in so far. True or false, we talked about this. This was definitely mentioned during the broadcast, if you're paying attention. We don't have anacondas here, nor giant cobras, nothing like that. We're, we're a little too chilly for them. 70 of you in the cahoot. This is amazing. Uh, 75 answers in. The answer is true, and most of you got that correct. They can be over two meters, yes? Yeah, they can be up to two and a half. Amazing. We have seen we have seen snakes that long in Thousand Islands. So very very cool. Quick Camel takes our lead. I kind of hope a snake name wins our Kahoot today, but for now, Quick Camel's got the lead. Good job, and we want you to let us know who you are in the chat when this is done, of course. Okay, what has not contributed? Keyword to the gray rat snake's population decline: road mortality, human persecution, disagreements with other snake species, or destruction of hibernation sites. Do the gray rat snakes just really not get along with the garters? I'm not sure. Seems maybe like an outlier. 30, oh, 40 androgen so far. Get them in. Let's see. The answer is disagreements with other snake species. That road mortality is something that contributes to the population decline. Might have missed that. Not in the beginning. And uh, road mortality is something that affects a lot of our species in our parks, Canada sites, and beyond. Great job, guys. Focused Wallaby takes our lead. Very Australian as we dive in with question number three. Here we go. I love questions coming in in the chat too. You guys are great. What is true about a hibernaculum? It is only suitable for warm-blooded species. Up to 60 snakes will hibernate in one. It is above ground. Or you would not find one in rocky areas. Hmm. Well, we're in a program on snakes, so maybe one of them is on the other thing. We got a rock picture there. I don't know. The true thing is up to 60 snakes. Allison, you snuck this in. This is like a, I did. a <laughs> Yeah, I like it. And most of our groups got this right. Very, very cool. Uh, let's see how that affects our leaderboard. Quick Camel comes back with the lead. Way to go, Quick Camel. Going into our final question. Up by seven points. True or false? The Algonquin to Adirondack Network was inspired by a moose named Alice. This is not Alice. This is a moose picture I found online, but she can fill the role of Alice for the purposes of our Kahoot. What do we think? Dun, 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 dun. 53 answers in so far. I'm going to be heading to Mapes Elementary for our first question in just a minute. A few of our classes just have audio today. Uh, 890 of you in Kahoot. Holy, what a fun time. It is true. Most of you got this right. This is right near the end again. Way to pay attention to these little tiny things you snuck into the presentation. Okay. Alice and Anik, we're going to check our podium. we got 15 minutes for an epic Q&A today. Noble Puffin comes in third. Joyful Rooster comes in second. And first, is it Camel? What do we think? It is Awesome Stork with an upset out of nowhere. Oh, let us know where you are in the chat. Thanks for playing along, everybody. And we are going to dive in with our Q&A. So as I said, I'm going to head to Mapes Elementary first. Uh, if you guys want to come on up, you're good to go for a question. Welcome in, guys. Two, three, fours. Hey. Hello. 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 Hey. <laughs> Do you have a snake question for Allison and Anna? We don't have a snake question, but we did want to know um, how many different species you would of like various animals you would find in Thousand Islands National Park. Yeah, so that's a hard question to answer because we have uh, we are we are the most biodiverse or tied for the most biodiverse national park in all of Canada. Um, but yeah, we have about 6,000 different species. That's everything from reptiles, amphibians, mammals, bird species, insects. Uh, it's pretty amazing. 
Um, we have, so the gray rat snakes are just one example of a species that only exists in Thousand Islands National Park. No other national park has them. Um, another example would be a type of tree that we have called pitch pine. It's a pretty cool place to, to live and work. I bet. What a cool place. I've been to Thousand Islands National Park. It's one of the most special places in all of Canada. I hope for all our students in Southern Ontario or beyond across Canada, the United States and beyond today, if you get the chance to come, it's a really unique part of the world. So I'm really glad we got that question generally on some cool stuff there. And I'm going to take Mia's question from Bayside Public School. She just shared in the chat, do gray rat snakes have a smell? I like this question. That that's a great question. Like, are you, you're asking, I assume, um, do gray rat snakes like do they smell different than other snakes? Or just in general, like I think a lot of people, and I know this from our other reptile programs, assume that reptiles don't have a smell at all. Do they produce anything? If you were to like pick up a snake and do they have anything? Do they make something maybe if you threaten them? No, so gray rat snakes don't make something called a musk. Some reptiles actually have the ability to um, use a stinky smell or a liquid that comes out of them that would hopefully make a predator think they're poisonous or something. Uh, gray rat snakes do not have that ability. Um, but whenever I've handled a gray rat snake, snake, they kind of, they have a bit of a smell just because they spend so much time on the ground near wet things. So they might have a bit of a musty smell, um, but with whatever they're carrying on them from their environment. Interesting. And I'm so glad you mentioned the musk thing as someone who's picked up many snakes in my life as a really enthusiastic reptile lover. Uh, there's nothing quite so horrible as being musked by a snake. It's quite, uh, <laughs> it stays on you for a very, very long time. Uh, just a testament to sort of leave and just enjoy animals from afar if you're out in nature, unless you know what you're doing. Uh, Miss Mustard's class, I'm going to head to you guys next for a live one. Then we'll take some from our YouTube friends. We've got a whole, like, full complement of classes today. So I promise I am coming to everyone. Miss Mustard, come on in. Hey. All right, so these guys are super excited because again, we were we're about two for two first place up the hoots <laughs> in the last two days. But that's awesome, guys. Um, how many species are of snakes are there in Ontario? In Ontario, whew, that's a great question. I'm trying to think. Um, I know we have six snake species in um, Thousand Islands. Um, but the number of snake species in Ontario, Ooh. I, I just did a quick search on this, but this is the half of one of these programs. So there's always a question that like stumps everybody. So it seems to be 19. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me, I'll confirm that for everyone in a minute. Um, but see, I, I love these questions. Way to go, Miss Mustard. That's a great question. Yeah. I'll get the actual for sure tally on that in two quick seconds. Um, I'm going to head to YouTube really quick. We've got so many classes joining us on YouTube. Welcome in, everybody. Let's see a first question. Jamie in Miss Craig's class wants to know why snakes grow slowly. Oh, that's a great question. Um, a lot of reptiles grow slowly um, just based on how it just it's their maturity level. Right. So a uh, pretty general answer for that would be that um, growing slowly and have having the ability to produce um, offspring. Uh, that is because it just takes up so much energy to do that. They would grow up to a point that it makes sense for them to expend that much energy. It doesn't always work out for animals uh, because we have seen such a high mortality rate. And we talked about that in the presentation. If they if we're losing so many before they're having babies, we're losing the population. Um, but in the past, that didn't matter as much because they were able to, to live to the point that they could have enough babies to keep the population at the level it was at. Yep. Great question, guys. And I did confirm, by the way, I added two that didn't exist. There are 17 species of snakes in Ontario. 17. There you go. There's your final tally confirmed by multiple sources. So that's very cool. That's awesome. Um, Mr. LeBrun's class, who joined us like every second day. Nice to have you guys back. Olivia wants to know, I love this question, if the rat snake can swim. Oh, can a rat snake swim? I'm sure a rat snake would be able to get themselves out of the water if they fell in. Um, but a common question we get at Thousand Islands, because we also have northern water snakes that uh, are all around our park, and they look very, very similar to a gray rat snake. So folks will come up to say they can swim. And I'll say, 
I, I don't doubt that a gray rat snake would have the ability. They're nice and strong, but it might have been a water snake you saw. You, I'm so glad you said that because that was where my mind went. I, knew, I grew up near a pond and there would be like tons of snakes in the water and there'd be a little island in the middle of the pond with literally like 40 snakes on it. And they're northern water snakes because they look yeah. just like the rat snakes that were nearby. Very cool. Uh, yeah. See, we're, we're, you're conquering misconceptions even in the Q&A, even from the host. They're doing a terrible job here. Um, I'm going to head to Mr. Hancock's class. Welcome in to Georgetown, guys, and take us away. Hey. hey, thanks for having us. Uh, a few of the students were wondering if you can explain exactly how a snake can smell with its tongue. Oh, yeah. Well, I won't I won't keep you for too long. But <laughs> so the snake's tongue actually has the ability to um, separate out the molecules uh, from a smell. So when we smell things as humans, um, what our body is doing is taking those molecules and the way that our body reacts to them, that is the different smells. The snake does the same thing. It has a very sensitive tongue in that sense that it will flick it around and any molecules that are coming from things around it will go in and their body will react and that's how they smell, really. Um, they're not using their nose. It's all in their tongue. So whatever their tongue absorbs, the molecules, that tells them what's around them. Great question, guys. I'm so glad we got that. I'd encourage our audience to look up the Vomero nasal. I'll put this in the chat too, in terms of snake smelling, because there's some really cool stuff. If you get into the nitty gritty of how snakes perceive the world, some amazing facts out there. So I encourage our classes to check that out. Um, Madam Donato's class, I know you guys have your camera off, but if you want to turn on your mic, I can take a question from you guys live. Uh, I'll give you a second to do that, and then we'll head to our Miss Altness class in just a second. Miss Donato, good to go, maybe? Hi. Find order? Hello. Hi. 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 I know. I'm excited too. But do you have a question for Allison? Um, oh, Joseph, English. 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 Do the rat snakes um, live in any other country? Yeah, good question. Yeah, that's a great question. Rat snakes do live in the United States. Um, if you hear people talk about rat snakes, they are now officially called the gray rat snake. Um, they used to be called in Ontario a black rat snake. So maybe folks around Canada have heard the, the name black rat snake. There are gray and black rat snakes, but uh, the ones up in Ontario were renamed gray in about 2009 because they were distinct from the black rat snakes in the southern U.S. So yes, rat snakes live in other countries, um, and there's a bunch of different types. It's so interesting to me that sorry, is it growing up in Toronto, our whole life was squirrels because they're everywhere, and ours are black, and that's pretty unique in southern Ontario in the world. Like people come to see our black squirrels. So the fact that we've got the gray snake instead of the black snake elsewhere. This is very nerdy. We're going down a tangent here. Um, I'm going to head to our Miss Alex's class, uh, Mr. Morton's class. Two threes. Hi, everybody. Ah! Yeah. Oh, that, that's how excited I am every time I hear about snakes, too. I'm so glad you guys are equally keen. Do you have a question for uh, Allison? Yeah. Uh, yes, we had a bunch. You do. I see that in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think our number one question is, what is the snake's skin like when they shed? What is the pattern of the skin like and why do they shed? Oh, those are great questions, guys. So um, we as humans, we shed our skin, too, because our skin, uh, it gets damaged. The skin cells get damaged. They are filled with um, a type of protein that make them really hard. And when that gets too old, it comes off. Um, snakes will shed their whole skin usually at once. It's also another process for snakes that take a lot of energy. When it comes off, um, it can come intact, like the one that Matt showed in our video where we have the length of the whole snake. Um, other times it'll come off in sections and break apart. It's a very thin, almost papery material, but a little bit uh, glossy, like, um, like a plastic cover for a piece of paper. It comes off like that, and it's just uh, the skin is a big protection for snakes, right? If they're on the ground all day, the skin is helping them, uh, you know, 
keep them safe from anything that they might uh, slither over. So if we uh, we want to make sure any damaged skin comes off, and that happens uh, periodically, about once a month, they'll shed their skin. And you'll notice if a, a snake's getting ready to shed, it'll be very calm, very sleepy. It's preparing itself. I hope our students get the chance. If you're ever in a forest, look for snake sheds. They're one of the coolest things you can find. A lot of zoos and aquaria, amazing places have snake sheds that you can actually play with or use or hold. Uh, Parks Canada sites will probably have this too in the interpretation centers. Uh, they're a really unique thing. I'm glad you tried to find an analogy for them. I've never heard someone try and find an analogy for snakes. It's a really unique material. Very cool. Um, Allison, we're entering the rapid fire round. I would love to take 27 more questions, but we've only got a few more minutes because time flies and you're having fun talking about all these great snakes. So I'm going to share a few quick questions from our YouTubers and live friends, and then we will wrap up in just a minute. Uh, Serenity at Bayside Public School wants to know, uh, how do gray rat snakes lay eggs? Oh, that's a great question. It's very similar to birds. They uh, they develop in their bodies and then they lay them and they'll uh, lay them usually in dead logs or under uh, rocks. And uh, we hope that no predator eats them. That's how they lay their yeah. eggs. Yeah. On the uh, egg note, Mr. LeBron's class, Maria wants to know how many babies or snakelets, as I've seen delightfully coined, the gray rat snake usually has. How many snakelets? Snakelets. Well, it depends on the snake. Um, they can have, I believe, up to 10 uh, eggs. Yeah. We've, um, I, I would encourage, uh, sorry, this is a vaguely related, but I'm going to share it with our classes who registered later too. Canada has the biggest agglomeration of snakes in the world that happens in Manitoba every year. So if you want to see like a bazillion snakes mating, getting ready to have tons and tons of babies, it's one of the most amazing things in all of nature. And I just, that's my weird follow up of the day. Uh, Poisonous snake notes. Do we have any dead, deadly snakes, venomous snakes here in Canada? Well, there is a, uh, a venomous snake in um, parts of Ontario called the Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, it has venom. If you're in an area where the Massasauga rattlesnakes are, most hospitals have an anti-venom. If you were to get bit by them, you'd be fine. Uh, but again, just don't corner animals. That's your best way to stay safe. Admire them from a distance. Yep. So that actually answers our next question, which is going to be, if you see a venomous snake, if you see a massive saga crossing the road, should you help it out or should you let it go? Or what, what's your advice? <laughs> um, your safety is first. Uh, if you're helping any, any animal cross the road, look out for your own safety. If you see a massive saga and you feel very uh, happy to help them, again, walk behind them, give them their space. If they move, they move. Um, but if you ever at any point notice that something goes wrong, back off, let the snake go. I'm really glad you mentioned that. And you said something in your talk that I want to highlight for all our students, because it's very important. Our kids in Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants are so concerned with animal welfare. We get animal welfare questions every day, even in space programs, really. People always throw in an animal welfare question. It's really quite delightful. If you have an animal that you're trying to help cross the road, make sure you cross it in the direction that the animal is trying to cross anyway. Turtles, this comes up a lot. People will grab the turtle that's close to the one side of the road and they'll put it back where they think it wants to go. Put it where it wants to go because that's where it's going to head. If you put it back down where it came from, it's just going to cross right again a few seconds later. So I'm really glad we got that point in the presentation. Allison, Anik, thank you so, so much for such an amazing presentation today. I'm going to encourage all our audience to check out the amazing work at Thousand Islands National Park with the link below. I'll make sure all our registered classes have that in a minute as well. Is there a final message from you both at the Thousand Islands News Network that you want to share with our students today before we bring them all in for and Nick, I'll leave that one to you. Oh, I'm just going to encourage the students to continue asking questions, go explore the natural world around you, and come and visit us at Parks Canada if you can this summer. Woohoo! I've got my camping ticket booked for Gross Morn here in Newfoundland. A little far for me to Thousand Islands, but I, I hope all our students get the chance to head out wherever you might be joining from. Uh, I'm going to bring in all our classes now. Ms. Donato, you can unmute your mic. Ms. Alskins and Ms. Morton, Mr. Hancock, Ms. Mustard, Bates Elementary, thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> 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 <laughs>